in this film, we're going to focus on the dynamic nature of vegetation. If you study vegetation for long enough, you find that it changes. And it changes for three main reasons. The resources uh, that are available in a plant community vary through time. So they might become more available and this causes the system to change. Vegetation will also be dynamic because of disturbance. Disturbance comes in lots of forms. It can be in large scale factors such as fire or perhaps cyclone damage or perhaps flooding. But disturbance can also be small scale. So the mere fact that a tree dies and falls down creates opportunities for new species to grow in an area. At even smaller scales, bandicoots uh, create small disturbances to the soil. And these small disturbances allow opportunities for species to regenerate. So taken together, this causes the system to change. Third reason that a system might change is because of the lifespan of the organisms in it. All things eventually die. And when they do die, that provides opportunities for change. Today we're going to focus on a directional change that occurs on beach ecosystems. And the primary reason for the change is time as it affects resource availability and the capacity of species to grow in this area. So I'm on Western Port Bay and we're going to follow what's called primary succession. Vegetation development from nothing, meaning there's no vegetation, through to some later successional stage, typically forest. I'm on Western Port Bay at Sandy Point where there's one of the best examples you can find in Victoria of primary succession. Primary succession is where vegetation develops where there previously wasn't any before. So where might you see primary succession? Well, I guess whenever a new rock is formed, uh, volcanic flows that lead to lava and therefore are just solid rock would be a place where primary succession occurs. But here down at the coast, primary succession occurs on areas where there's bare sand and vegetation colonises that sand and then starts changing the properties of that area so more complex ecosystems can develop. I'm going to talk about how vegetation develops in these areas as an example of vegetation change in time. But of course we can't show this time uh, change, so what we have to do is move across different age dunes to represent time using space. This is called a chrono sequence. On beaches, the sand is unstable, it moves around. And you know that, because when the wind blows, often the wind will blow sand and it hits at your feet and it stings. That same effect actually would abrade plants if the sand wasn't stabilised. And so the crucial first phase of primary succession is there has to be a species that can colonise sand that has almost no nutrients, almost no water in it, doesn't hold water. And that plant in many places around the world is a dune binding grass. Here in Australia that dune binding grass is spinifex. You can see it behind me in a superb example of colonisation of the beach and then as a consequence of stabilising the sand the movement of that sand slows down. It starts building a dune. Around me you can see the basis of the primary dune developing. A grass called spinifex has colonised this area and stabilised the movement of uh, sand and as a consequence initiated this process of succession. How does spinifex do that? Well, it has relatively large seeds and that's really critical because large seeds tend to have lots of resources in them for the seedlings. So the seedling can establish, despite the fact there are very few soil nutrients here. Being large seeded means that it can live for a longer period of its endosperm. When it does grow, this plant grows using stolons. So a stolon is a surface running, or a surface root, uh, surface stem, sorry. We can see the leaves, there's not much to them, they're thick and hairy, so that's to minimise moisture loss. 
but in each of the nodes here, 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 roots are sent down. And it's those roots that are really critical for stabilizing the sand. The profile of the plant is low to the dune, so it means it's not getting exposed to any, well, to, to less salt than it might if it was standing up tall. And also it doesn't get abraded by the sand nearly as much as it would if it was standing upright. Because of the colonization of spin effects of this dune, it's a dune binding grass, it initiates a whole process that leads to a complex vegetation. Let's see how that process continues from this point. I'm now on the lee side of the dune, so that means the back side of a dune. So it's now a bit more out of the wind. And what you can see is in this part of the first primary dune, new species are colonising. And here we've got the primary shrub species that colonises dunes along the southern uh, coast of Australia. This is called coast wattle, Acacia sophorae. It's typically always the first species to turn up on the lee side of dunes and it plays a really critical role in the primary succession of this ecosystem in time. You can see it's got low stems and they're spreading so it occupies relatively large areas so it continues to stabilize the dune no doubt but it starts changing the dune from a nutrient perspective and it does that in two ways. Below ground this plant is fixing nitrogen it's a leguminous plant so it's got nodules that are fixing nitrogen from the atmosphere. That's contributing, contributing to this plant's growth. Remember here, it's very infertile. There's almost no nutrients. This plant's a big woody plant. It's growing very fast in this high light environment. And it's spreading quite largely, or quite a way across this dune. So not only is it fixing nitrogen, some of that nitrogen is now returning back to the soil here, or the primary substrate. And it's doing that through litter turnover. These large phyllodes are turning over relatively rapidly. And if I look around, I could probably find some. There's one right there. A large leaf turning over, breaking down, adding organic matter to the soil. And this is the starting point of soil formation that will ultimately lead to the development of a forest. I've now come in about 50 metres from the primary dune, and I'm on what's called the secondary dune. You can probably guess that as we move further inland, we're going to move on to the tertiary dune. This is an older dune. It's been stabilised for longer than the primary dune. There are no grasses here anymore. Uh, the spin effects has died out. Its primary role here is to colonise bare soil. And then once the wattle, the acacia, gets taller, it gets shaded out. The acacia is now dominating the system. It's playing that important role of fixing nitrogen. It's adding to litter, so the soil nutrients are going up. Indeed, we're starting to see a soil profile develop. So instead of just seeing the yellow-orange sand uh, that's present down on the beach, we're getting a thin layer of grey or black organic matter developing on the soil surface. What's really important about acacia's role here is it's stabilised the site, it's increased the fertility of the site such that new species can start colonising. So species that need higher soil nutrients can now start establishing on the secondary dune. Those species are primarily shrubs, such as coast tea tree. Uh, there's some other daisy bushes that do the same role here and some uh, drought tolerant smaller herbaceous species. So typically with primary succession, we go from just one species on the primary dune to more species on the secondary dune. And as we go further inland, we get even more species. Let's go and take a look at the tertiary dune. I've now moved another 50 or so metres inland from where we started. And we're now on what's called the tertiary dune. So it's the third dune in from the beach. This dune is probably of the order of age perhaps 100 years old. So the dune was colonised by grasses 100 years ago, then colonised by acacia, and has now been fully occupied by coastal tea tree, Leptospermum labigatum. We saw some evidence of Leptospermum just starting to establish on the secondary dune, so it requires clearly higher fertility and 
better growing conditions than the acacia. That's why it comes in after the acacia. This is a critical kind of concept. The early June development facilitates the future arrival of species that require different types of environments. So what's changed at this site relative to where we were before? Well, the most fundamental change is that the soils are better developed. We've got a century of litter fall and litter decomposition, which are adding nutrients to the soil. The soil now is getting quite dark, at least on the top layer, and that's all because of organic matter deposition. What you'll also notice is the vegetation is much denser and taller than where we started. So this is a clear sign that productivity is increasing with succession. And this is typical in most successional processes. We start from very low productivity ecosystems to very high productivity ecosystems. Behind me, you can see some different species from where we started as well. And that's not to be unexpected. The tea tree is modifying the environment. It's actually quite cool and dark in here today. The organic matter is higher, there's more water, there are more nutrients. So the species that require higher resources will start to colonise in time uh, in this more complicated vegetation. We're going to go to one more dune, a bit further inland, and that dune might be about a thousand years old. And we can do, we know that, we can date the soils. Let's have a look at what type of vegetation develops on these much older dunes. And let's also understand why that's happened and summarise primary dune succession. I've come in quite a long way now from the coast. I'm probably on the 5th or the 6th June, it's a little hard to tell, but we've got a very different vegetation type developing here. The sequence of succession has led to a forest, and in this case that forest is composed primarily of Banksia integrifolia, the coast Banksia. This species is a slow growing and long lived species. It started to colonise those tertiary dunes, but it's taken some time for those early successional species to die out and this long-lived species to then dominate the ecosystem. It's a self-sustaining ecosystem now. Banksia can continue to regenerate in this environment and perpetuate itself. So it's unlikely that we'll see further changes in the ecosystem, at least in the dominant species. Two things you might want to note about this site. The productivity has increased dramatically from where we last uh, examined the dunes. These big forest trees are storing lots of carbon, they're tall growing, up to 25 metres in height, I'd say. And there's lots of understory species. There's shrubs, there's grasses now, and there's some sedges. The second thing about this ecosystem is it's very diverse. Where we started one species on the primary dune, we now have dozens. And that's a common feature of primary succession. We go from simple ecosystems to complicated ecosystems. So let's summarise what we've learned about primary succession. Succession is directional change in vegetation through time. It's very predictable. It goes from very nutrient poor soils to richer soils because of organic matter inputs from the trees themselves and the plants themselves. It goes from a very simple system to a very complicated system. And that's a fundamental feature of any successional process that starts from bare sand or bare rock. Other types of vegetation change will likely occur here uh, in time. If this site gets burnt, then what we see resprouting and reseeding will be a function of what's here to start with, the initial floristic composition, but we might see different abundances of those species. And they'll change over time as the lifespans of the plants change. If this site uh, suffers from wind blowdowns, trees come down because of trees, we might see a greater increase in species that require high light uh, than in shades, the tolerant species. But what we're likely to see is some sort of representation of the original vegetation that was here prior to those disturbances. And that's the fundamental differences between primary succession and what's known as secondary succession.
Secondary succession is just a playing out of the species that were already here and how they respond to disturbance. Primary, of course, is starting from zero species and working their way through to more complicated ecosystems.